D&D has a number of optional rules uh, located in the Dungeon Master Guide, um, as well as like sprinkled into the player handbook and a couple other places. Today's video, we're going to be looking at all of the optional combat rules in the DMG, and I'm going to be ranking them in the ultimate rank of the... God, no, it's not the ultimate. It's just my opinion. But come along for this fun ride. <laughs> Almost all of these are from Chapter 9 of the Dungeon Master's uh, Guide, which is the Dungeon Master's Workshop. Uh, and let's jump into it. So starting off with the initiative variance, we have initiative score. So this optional rule allows um, that you're not going to be rolling initiative all the time, and instead all, every creature has an initiative score, cuts down on doing the math, having to figure out initiative each time. I'm kind of mixed on this uh, because especially if you have like people who have the same uh, dexterity modifier, how do you decide who goes first? Um, you probably are going to end up rolling to decide that anyhow. Um, so I'm going to put that as a C. It's kind of middle ground for me. Then we have side initiative, and this is the idea that like um, all of the uh, PCs and then all of the monsters or everybody who's on one side. So if you have like multiple sides, uh, like one group of monsters and then another group of monsters that are all attacking, roll a d20 for each group and that determines the initiative. I don't love this one. Um, and, the, and, and then everybody, I should also say, and then everyone goes... Like, this side all goes, and then the other side all goes. Now, I don't love this one because I feel like it... I, I've been in some games where it's kind of done this way, and I feel like it can feel very... Especially if the other side goes first, like, oh my god, this is so bad because we're all getting beaten up and we're not getting a chance to, like, change things um, or, like, heal ourselves... And so I don't think I would ever want to play in a game with this rule. I think it does make the DM's job easier. Um, it does say it encourages teamwork. And I guess that's the idea of like, well, we can all plan, like, we're all going to do this thing together. But I think you can kind of do that still within the normal initiative rule, um, maybe a little less so. But I think the teamwork side doesn't outbalance the like, oh shoot, the other side just wiped us all out. We are going to put that as an E. I'm not a huge fan. The, the thing that's saving it from an F is the possibility of teamwork. So next we have speed factor, which you basically like everyone decides what their action is going to be and then rolls initiative. And depending on your action, that's going to affect like how fast you act so it's going to add a modifier like spell casting is going to subtract this the spell's level um you know a like melee light is going to actually add and a melee with a two-handed weapon is going to subtract for me that's adding a lot of additional math i also think it's it gets into a weird area where it's like, okay, well, if I've planned out everything I want to have happen, but then, like, somebody's out of my spellcasting range because they moved, or, um, you know, the thing I had, I, I was going to go hit this person, but they fell, they're down already, so the attack that I was going to use against, against them it isn't effective, just basically lose a turn. So for me, again, I don't ever see wanting to play with this, and I can't really see a redeeming factor to this. So this is going to get an F. I think it's a bad rule. Moving into our action options. Uh, so the first one is uh, rules for climbing onto a bigger creature. So this is basically saying like, well, normally if you would want to jump onto another creature, it's a grappling um, but a, a small creature is not going to be able to grapple a huge creature. But if you think about it, like, a little tiny small creature can probably jump on the back of a huge or gargantuan creature and, like, ride it um, or climb on it. And I 
I've kind of done this in games. I didn't actually realize there were optional rules for this. Um, so it's the idea of like, okay, well, instead of trying to do a grapple, you are going to make like a strength, an athletics, or an acrobatics check to see if you're able to jump on, uh, and then the target will have a dexterity check to kind of see if they're able to get out of the way. And then you, like, move around with the creature, and the creature can also, like, try and knock you off. I think actually having some clear rules for this is really useful, and um, I totally have done this in-game or seen other players do this in-game, and I'm glad that I know these rules now exist so that, you know, I can, I can, I can use these rules instead of just kind of making something up on the fly. So I'm going to say climb onto a bigger creature is going to go up as an A. I think that's a good one. Next we have disarm, um, which is just rules for making how to disarm a, a, a someone. Useful not anything like spectacular. Again, didn't realize this was an optional rule as I, we've, I've done it in game. I'm gonna just kind of put it as B, just it exists there, it's, it's fine. Next we have Mark. This one I'm not so sure on. Basically it's like melee combats um, can basically say like I'm focusing on this person so if uh, they try and like get out of their range they can have advantage on attacks of opportunity um, and it doesn't use their reaction, but they can only do one attack of opportunity. I'm not really sure on this one. I could see this becoming maybe a little broken, um, especially with some like upper level um, fighters and, and melee and uh, classes. So, hmm, I think I'm going to just kind of put it as C. I'm not really sure. It's kind of middle for me. I don't know if I'd use it. I think I'd need to see it used in a game a couple of times before I really made my mind up on this one. Overrun. Here are some rules for if you want to like move through a hostile creature's space, make a strength check against the other player's strength check. Again, this is something I think I've done in a game. Didn't necessarily realize it was an optional rule. Um, I, th I think I've also seen, like, uh, th there's an another optional rule that's called tumble that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, let's just talk about both of them right now. So tumble is basically, like, you can tumble through a hostile creature space, and so you use dexterity. For me, it's nice having these rules in here, but um, I think, again, it's just kind of a matter of, like, I wouldn't necessarily say, like, I'm overrunning this person or I'm tumbling through this person and just say, like, I'm going to try and get past them, and then in describing how I'm doing it, the DM will determine, like, is that strength uh, athletics or is that a dexterity thing? Um, so kind of middle of the ground for me. Um, I think maybe needing to, like, use the proper terms if, if you're in a, like, very by-the-books game might be be a little annoying. Um, like if you say like, I'm going to overrun this character and you actually mean tumble. So I'm going to kind of shove it in the sea again. It's fine. It's not great. And the final in kind of the action options is shove aside. And so this is like, if you would rather shove somebody to the side rather than away. So technically the shove action is like, okay, I'm going to push this person back away from me, but this could be like, I'm, I'm shoving them aside. Um, again, nice to have this, like, yes, this is possible. Um, for me, this is maybe like, doesn't, wouldn't necessarily need to be like spelled out as a different action from a shove. I think it's gonna be a D. I don't really need this to be like a, a de definitive different rule other than shove. I'm not a rules lawyer. I'm not a rules lawyer. So now we've got a few miscellaneous optional rules and we have hitting cover. So this is the idea of like, okay, well, if you miss a, your target, um, but that target is hiding or, or has some kind of cover, you would roll to see like, do I miss it completely or hit the, co the cover? And it's basically like, well, what's the DC for the Thing that is covering it. 
Um, and I do like that it specifies if the creature is providing, if a creature is providing cover um, for the missed creature and the attack roll exceeds the AC of the covering creature, the covering creature is hit. That's a pretty nice um, clarification, especially like if you're like, I'm going to hide behind the horse. Your horse might get killed. Uh, <laughs> so I, I kind of like that rule. I think that might be an A. Mm, no. No, I think it's a B. I think it's another B. I want to take a moment to thank all of our patrons, especially RV. If you enjoy watching our videos, please consider heading on over to our Patreon page and consider supporting us there. You get a couple of cool perks, and it is the best way to directly support what we do. All right, let's get back to the video. Next, we have cleaving through creatures. So the idea is, like, if you reduce a creature to zero hit points, um, any excess damage would then carry over to another creature nearby. I really like this, especially if you have, like, little hordes of goblins or or smaller, as it said, smaller creatures, um, especially for, like, a barbarian or somebody who's able to do quite a lot of damage where it can feel a little like, ah, yes, I hit this one creature and did, like, huge amounts of damage. But it, you know, the, the creature had five hit points, so it it doesn't really matter. Um, I think that can that could be a very fun rule. Um, and I, again, I think I've been in a game that used this optional rule without necessarily the GM acknowledging, like, hey, this is an optional rule we're going to use. They just were like, yeah, sure, this seems like fun. Um, so that's something I think I definitely would use in my next game that I run. I don't know, put that as an A, because I definitely would use it. Next optional rule is injuries. Damage leaves some kind of injury, some kind of lingering effect. And there are a couple different ways that you take on injury. It's not just every single piece of damage, but like significant damage. As well as they have a nice little like table that you can roll on um, to determine what the injury is, or the player can kind of make something up and then you can determine what lasting effect that has. I think this is very a, um, a, decis a decisive uh, optional rule um, that I would not use in every single game, but especially if you're playing kind of a like very gritty game or you're wanting it to be maybe a little bit more real and less just completely fant uh, fantas fantastical. Um, then I could see using this, uh, and I could also maybe see using it in a fantasy game for maybe, um, like, okay, we're not going to have it every time your character is reduced to zero death points, but use the, hey, if you failed at saving, death saving throw by a significant amount, um, that might be an interesting way, and, and I do like the idea of, like, characters having some kind of scar or indication of, like, significant injuries. Um, maybe not always the lingering effects, uh, but again, for a realistic or, like, more gritty game, I could see that being useful. So I think I'm going to put that as a B. It's not kind of a, like, yes, this is awesome, but I could see the use. You go to the Bs. The next rule is massive damage. If a creature takes damage that is over half of its hit point maximum. Um, you roll on a shock table to see what the effect is. And it could be that they drop to zero hit points. It could be that they can't take reactions. It could be that they're stunned. There are a couple different options. Um, I've known people that have definitely played with this rule. Um, i not sure if I would play have that in a game that I was running, I'm going to add a caveat. I think I would use it in a higher level game. I think this is a rule that um, is more problematic in a lower level game because it's much more likely, like, if I'm playing a wizard that has 12 hit points, um, if somebody rolls a d6 and has, you know, rolls a 6, I would take massive damage. And so I think it's it's a better rule for higher level games to have the impact of taking a whole ton of damage actually be really impactful um, 
when you have like, I've got over 100 hit points. Oh shoot, somebody just did 60 hit points worth of damage. We're gonna put that in the B category. Next we have morale. So this gives definite rules for determining when a creature or monster would flee if things are not going their way. Um, I like having some like maybe more defined rules for this uh, and, you know, as a, a GM, kind of having a little bit of guidance. This is something I've done um, just kind of being like, hey, you know, monsters aren't dumb. If they're massively losing the battle and they don't see, like, you know, they don't see a way of being successful or they've taken a lot of damage or... Um, you are completely surprised they might not immediately attack but instead choose to just run away like ah mm. i think it's kind of again like it's nice to have these rules and maybe a couple of things of like here's the wisdom check to roll to make this decision but me i think most gms uh dms are not necessarily going to need to have definitive rules they'll just kind of like hey, I can apply some logic to my creatures and have them kind of be like, this is not going well. I'm going to try and run away. I think for me, it's a D. Like, I don't, eh. it's nice to have it there, but um, I, don't I don't really need it that much. And the final one that I'm going to talk about um, is not in chapter nine. Uh, it is in chapter eight because it's in with talking about the miniatures, and that is flanking. And flanking is a rule that um, I think every single game I have played in has used flanking. I did not realize it was an optional rule because it has been used so much. It is a lot easier to use if you're using miniatures than if you're just doing theater of the mind. I have, I think I have been in a combat where we kind of did uh, apply flanking in theater of the mind just of describing the situation. Um, it made a lot of sense, like we were in a hallway and we're on either, had managed like corner the person basically in the hallway on either side um so I think for me the fact that like this is an optional rule that I had no idea was actually an optional rule I, th I every single game I've been in has played flanking almost every single player I've ever talked to is like oh yeah we use flanking of course we use flanking so for me that is going to make flanking our one and only s because I always want to use flanking. I think it's a great rule. So there you go. That is my ranking of the um, <laughs> optional combat rules that are located in, located in the DMG. So what do you think about my tier ranking? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Uh, are there any rules on here that uh, you particularly like or dislike? Let's chat about it in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this format of video, I would love to do kind of some more tier rankings. I can do like some of the other optional rules in the DMG, or I can also do this for other systems. Like, um, <clears throat> you know, Pathfinder 2nd Edition has a bunch of the subsystem rules. I could go through and rank those. So let me know if you want me to do that. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Roll for Initiative. Bye! Uh, so we've got side initiative. Can I spell today? That's another fun question.